Ready? Okay, um, hi everyone. My name is Mallory Snow. I'm a master's student at the University of Waterloo and I'm a part of the Neurocognitive Computing Lab. And I work under the supervision of Professor Jeff Orchard. And today I'm going to be presenting our work on a biological softmax function, which we demonstrate in modern hot field networks. So I realized I probably didn't need to start from this far back for this group of people, but just to start from the very top, um, artificial neural networks are essentially systems that are very loosely based on the neural networks in our brains in that they are made up of artificial neurons and connected in the form of layers. And these connections have weights associated with them that are learned in order to compute or achieve a certain task. Hotfield networks were introduced by John Hotfield in 1982 and they are recurrent neural networks that store binary patterns as memories and they can retrieve them when given a partial or noisy version of one of these patterns. And in this sense, it acts as a content addressable memory or a CAM, which is essentially a system that when given a partial version of a pattern, it can produce the best match from memory. And human memory retrieval has a lot of similarities to this process, often referred to as auto-associative memory whereby a full idea or memory is elicited by partial information. So just here, I'm sure you automatically sense three and seven are missing. You can automatically correct these misspelled words and read this with ease. And you sense that this is a cat hiding behind this curtain. So hot field networks are more biologically plausible than your typical feed forward ANN since they are recurrent. So information is uh, passed recurrently rather than in one direction. And all operations that occur within them are local, so they only depend on values that are directly connected to them. So we can think of the binary pattern memories as being stored in the weights of these networks. And we can describe the state of the network at a given time uh, using an energy function. And we can think of this energy as being a measurement of inconsistency or conflict within the network between adjacent neurons um, at a given state. And in this sense, we can write it in terms of an interaction function that describes the interaction between these adjacent neurons. And in the traditional case, it's x squared. So if we initialize these neurons in our network to a perturbed version of one of our target memories, they will update themselves according to this update rule to converge to the correct version of the target that is stored in the memory. And these updates correspond to the minimization of the energy or the minimization of the conflict or inconsistency in the network. So just as an example, if we consider these four uh, patterns to be the memories we want to store in our network, and we initialize it in this messy version of pattern B, and we apply the update, we can retrieve the full memory with no errors. So much more recently, um, modern hot field networks were introduced by Krotov and Hotfield. And they're essentially just like the regular hot field networks, except they use interaction functions of the form x to the n, where n is a positive integer. Of course, n equaling 2 reduces to the traditional case. And although uh, this improved a lot of aspects of hot field networks, like the storage capacity and robustness to adversarial attacks, it moved the implementation further from being biologically plausible in that we now rely on these many body synapses. As we can see here, comparing the original um, hot field network with an interaction function of x squared to an interaction function of x cubed. So to address this problem, they introduced a new network where they separated the, ne the neurons into a group of hidden or memory neurons, which there's n h of these and we denote them by h and enumerate by mu. And we connect them to these feature neurons, um, or so we denote these V and enumerate uh, them by I, and there's NV of these. And so the feature neurons are what take on the pattern values here, and the hidden or memory neurons job is to decide what pattern from memory these feature neurons best correspond to. And so the network that we look at specifically here corresponds to model B from Krotov and Hopfield's work. However, we just nickname it the LSE network, uh, standing for log sum exponential, and this will become more obvious in a moment. So these networks uh, form a bipartite graph, so there's no connections within each population. They just are connected to each other. And each uh, target here in the feature neurons corresponds to a one-hot representation in the hidden nodes. 
And this connection uh, weight matrix here is symmetric and they store the weights just like in the original hot field networks. So uh, we can then describe the uh, activity of the neurons in continuous time using these coupled dynamic equations where the output of each neuron is a function of their corresponding input. So for the hidden neurons, the soft max function is used and for the feature neurons, uh, the identity or no function is used. And so the I here just represents an external input that we can apply to the feature neurons, which we can turn on and off using this beta term. And so this input, if it corresponds to a perturbed version of a target pattern, as soon as the input is turned off, the memory neurons uh, will take full control and uh, update the feature neurons to the correct version of the target. And the memory neurons will correspond to the one hot of that. So the issue here is with the use of the softmax function, um, since it's a sort of normalization with respect to all other neurons in the memory population. This means that the output of say this neuron here depends on this neuron over here and they aren't connected. So how it gets that information is poses some biological impossibility. So just to illustrate that a bit further, I'll go into how this works with respect to the LSE network. So we can think of the softmax function as converting a vector of numbers into a vector of probabilities. So specifically here, if we consider these three rows to be the memories that we want to store in our network, and if at a given point in time, the feature neurons are equal to these values, then the network will quickly realize that this looks a lot like a pattern in our memory, except there's one error, there's one bit that's flipped. And it'll pass this information to the hidden neurons, multiplying it by the connection weights, and it will be passed to the softmax function to arrive at the probability that these neurons correspond to pattern one, pattern two, and pattern three. And of course, it assumes that it is most likely corresponding to the third pattern. And so these continue communicating back and forth until the feature neurons correspond to the correct version of a target from memory, and the hidden neurons correspond to this pre one hot representation. So again, the problem here is that the output of this neuron depends on the activity of these neurons and they aren't connected. So there's still a biologically implausible aspect here. So our goal is to create a more biologically plausible version of the LSE network by implementing the softmax function in a more biological realistic way. And then of course we wanna verify that our biological LSE works the same as the original. So before I get into how we did this, I'll just show you how the original behaves so we know what to expect out of our biological version. So here I'm just showing you um, the state of the network over time. Here I'm showing the feature neurons and the hidden neurons before and after the softmax function is applied. And each line here just represents a different neuron over time. And the shaded region represents when the input is on. And the input here corresponds to a perturbed version of a target memory where three bits specifically are flipped. And uh, of course, the feature neurons are driven by both its, the memory and this input. So there's this sort of battle going on between them. And then as soon as the input is turned off, the hidden neurons take full control and correct these bits. So in this sense, it's still, it acts as a cam. And this is the behavior we want to see out of our biological version. So now I'll show you how we implemented the softmax biologically. Um, we did this by using a network of neurons rather than just applying the softmax to each neuron. Um, so we did this by implementing it in the log domain and just applying some simple log rules to find that the log of the softmax of a given hidden neuron mu is that, given, that hidden neuron minus the log of the sum of these exponential of the H's or the LSE of H. And so to implement this, we created a B node to collect this sum of the exponential of the H's. And then it projects the log of this value, so the LSE of H, to these R neurons, which also get input from the corresponding H neurons to compute this subtraction. And then, of course, to get back out of the log domain, we just apply the exponential and store the uh, softmax of the H values in these F neurons. So just to show you that this does actually compute the softmax of the hidden neurons, uh, we, can, we just held H constant for a random uh, set of H values and then ran the rest of the network to equilibrium. And we can see that it indeed does approach these dotted lines, which represent the expected values of the 
softmax of the H. Of course, in our LSE, we'll uh, be finding that there's behavior that looks more like this, where one element is larger than the others. So to implement this in our network, we basically just, instead of um, applying the softmax function, we just ran the H values through this sub network that computes the softmax and then just projected the exponential of the R values directly back into the feature neurons. And so then we could describe the entire network using this um, coupled dynamical system. And to make it even more biologically uh, realistic, we wanted to learn these weights rather than just storing the targets in there directly and just setting them to these values. So to do this, we clamped the feature and hidden neurons to the ideal values, and then looked at how we could adjust the weights to minimize the energy. So basically performing gradient descent and then describing it in continuous time using this equation. Um, we can implement it in our network using e to the r, since that's our way of uh, computing the softmax. And then since v and h are clamped, we can quickly run um, this sub softmax network to equilibrium, which then pushes the weights to be uh, learned to the target values. So just to visualize, of course, if we use random weights, there's nothing stored in these in the memory, so nothing will be restored. However, when we learn the correct weights, we see a behavior that looks a lot more like the original LSE. So just to verify that this behavior does happen um, in general and that it does act like a CAM, we basically uh, ran experiments where we would construct random um, binary targets and then construct that and those targets are the ones we want to store in memory. And then we constructed a separate random binary input and looked at what target from memory was closest to this binary input. And then, so we would turn this input on for one second and then turn it off and run it for another second. And if at the end, we see that the network converged to the target from memory that's closest to this input, then that is a success as a CAM. And so uh, for an ideal CAM, for an LSE, here, this would uh, do this all the time. And in our case, we found it to work upward of 94% of the time, um, which is great since here we're learning all of our weights and everything um, and reinitializing it each time. So we also wanted to look at um, the multi-stability of the network. So not only do we want there to be multiple equilibrium states here, we want to make sure that they correspond to target memories. They're not just meaningless equilibrium states uh, that don't really correspond to anything. So no spurious states. And so to illustrate this, we basically um, or initialized the network in a given target state and then provided the feature neurons with a very brief um, input that corresponded to a different target. And then before it had a chance to converge to the second target, we turned it off. And if it continued to converge to this second target pattern, we marked this as a success. And we can view this as sort of changing the network's mind in the sense that it's first thinking about this one memory or concept, and then we give it a very brief reminder of something else, and it switches to thinking about this second um, idea or memory. So, um, and we see that this happens like almost all the time, so 99% of the time, which is very similar to how an ideal CAM should behave. Um, so although we did see that our bio LSE works a lot like the original and that it works as a CAM, um, there are some more steps that could be taken to uh, make this model even more biologically realistic. One is that although we're learning um, the weights on one side, we are weight copying to the other side, so just taking the transpose. So um, strategies for learning that other side of weights would obviously make it all the more biologically realistic. Um, and we also have a one-hot hidden representation here. So this alludes to the idea that there's one neuron per target. And although there's some people say that there's a Jennifer Aniston cell or a grandmother cell, we know that it's usually populations of neurons that encode these ideas or uh, memories. So having a more combinatorial representation in that hidden layer would be even more biologically realistic. And thank you so much for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions.